Morning all. Spiffy. There is no chuck. Yeah, yeah. How does one open them? Okay, everybody. First, the attendance uh, post is Piazza Post 623. Please sign up. And uh, afterwards, the usual story get your name tags out and shut your laptops. We will begin. Okay, everybody get set, please. Again, so again, shut your laptops, everybody. Get set. It's 8 a.m. Uh, we have uh, uh, in the first uh, series of lectures we introduced neural networks and discussed how we can train them. So in the next set of four lectures, we are going to uh, sort of build on what we've learned, but we are not going to be we are now going to be talking about scanning for patterns. So let's, here's what we've learned so far. MLPs, we found are universal function approximators. They can approximate pretty much anything, whether they be Boolean functions, classifiers, or regressions. And they can be trained through variants of gradient descent, where gradients are computed using backpropagation. And the model we've used so far is something of this kind, where you had a uh, uh, directed graph, directed uh, network of neurons which was arranged in layers. Some input went in, and, you, made, and uh, you got some classification predictions for what the class might be or uh, the real valued uh, output that you wanted in the output layer. Now let's change the problem. Here's a task. I give you lots of speech recordings in spectrographic form. And these recordings have, have the word welcome somewhere in it. So now what kind of classifier, what kind of neural network would we build for a, uh, a problem of this kind? Presumably you just pass the entire thing to a multi-layer perceptron and eventually you get a classification output at the end which tells you whether the word welcome occurred in the recording or not. This is the, this is the obvious thing to do. But then here's my question. So you know, this is a trivial solution. Train an MLP for the entire recording, right? There's a problem with the trivial solution. If I have a network that has been trained on recordings where the word welcome occurs early in the recording, will the same network uh, 
recognize the word welcome if it occurs in a different location? Why not? It's been primed to look for it in one place. So it's been primed to look for it in one place. Uh, specifically, yeah, you're really speaking of completely different subspaces, right? So you can think of the, if I think of this recording as, let's say, a long vector, when the word welcome occurs in it, you have something in this region. If the word, if the word welcome occurs here, if the word welcome occurs here, you have something in this region. They're different subspaces. They're invoking different components of the input. So clearly, something that's been trained on the first uh, set will not work on uh, first uh, type of recording will not work on the second type. Now, on the other hand, what we need, so how could you deal with this? If I want the word, the network to record, recognize the word welcome regardless of where it happens, how would you deal with it? You can scan, well, the trivial solution, before we even begin speaking of scan, scanning, is just have lots and lots of training data with the word welcome in every position, right? What would be the problem with that? Can you shut your laptop, please? Yeah. What would be the problem with that? You would need too much data, and the network would have to be huge, right? What we are looking for is a simple network that will fire regardless of the location of welcome and not fire when it doesn't occur. Same thing with images, right? If I'm looking for this, uh, if I'm trying to, I'm considering this problem, does the word, uh, does, the, does the image contain a flower? Now, I could use my MLP to train, uh, to, I could train my MLP on images with flowers in them, but then an MLP that has trained, that has been trained on uh, images with flowers in the top left corner will similarly not fire if in the test data the flower occurs in the bottom right corner. And so once again, we are left with a situation where, you know, on the one hand, you could just train it with lots and lots of images with flowers everywhere, but you're going to need, there are so many possible starting positions that the amount of training data required is going to be huge. We want a simple network that will fire regardless of the precise location of the target object. So in, these are all problems where the location of the pattern is not important, only the presence of the pattern is important. Now, conventional MLPs are sensitive to the location of the pattern. So if I just move the entire flower by just one pixel, as we saw, the input now lives in a different subspace. And so the network is not going to fire. So you want the network to continue to fire even if the basic pattern itself has been shifted in the input. So in other words, you want the network to be shift invariant, right? Now. What's the solution for this? As uh, Karthik just mentioned, this, uh, a simple solution would be for me to just scan. So I could build a network. I might have a rough idea of how wide the word welcome is. And so I could build a network that uh, looks at a segment of the input, which is approximately the duration of the word welcome. And then I could just scan the input, try to locate each position, and find out if the word welcome has occurred there. And then eventually, I'm going to have classified as many windows of the input as, the, as I can fit. And I'm going to get one classification output within each window. But then the question I'm asking is, does the word welcome occur in this recording? What I have got instead is a classification output at each position. How do I convert the latter to the former? How do I convert? a classification output at each position to a general answer to, does this entire recording contain, contain the word welcome? Anyone? Yeah. Just say I can just order them all together. I can just pick the largest, right? I can uh, take the max. And if even one of them, one of the windows has the word welcome in it, the corresponding output is going to be large, close to one. And so the max value will be close to one. And so the max is you know, close to one. I know that the recording has the word welcome somewhere in it. Now, if the word welcome never occurs, then the maximum value is going to be small across all windows, right? Uh, and instead of taking the, taking the maximum, I could actually train a perceptron to uh, 
compute the max or even uh, put it through, which, which would be a soft max or a logistic, or even put it through a little MLP. But then eventually what we're really looking at is some operator which is, which is similar to the max operator to decide if the word welcome has occurred anywhere in the recording, right? So here is the overall pattern, right? We are scanning the input left to right. At each position, we are picking up a segment of the input. We are passing that segment of the input through a classifier, which generates an output. And then on the collection of outputs, one from each window, we are performing an, a, a max or a soft max, right? I can do the same thing with uh, images, right? But again, but then if I go back and take a look at it, this is all just one giant network. Because what happened? At each position, I passed the input through an MLP, but then the outputs of the MLP were finally also passed through a softmax. So this entire thing can be viewed as just one giant network with one fine distinction, which is that. Yeah. We're on for the second slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's still just a big network, right? It has many subnetworks, and the subnetworks at the lower layer are all identical. So basically, these guys are all identical, and that's the one restriction that we've imposed on it. And by making all of these subnetworks identical, we made the uh, network fire for the, say, for, for the pattern discovered by the subnet, regardless of the location. And so now the network became shift invariant. And so, I can think of this entire thing as just one network, with the final softmax just being the output layer of the network, right? And so this whole thing, I could have just written the entire, so, entire uh, uh, pseudocode as giant MLP. Same thing with images. I could build a little MLP which looks for flower patterns in a little box, in a little window, and then I could scan the input with this MLP and get a classification output at each position. And then finally, I could just pick the max of the outputs from each position. And if the image has a flower in it, then at least one of these positions would have resulted in a large output, and the max is going to be large, otherwise it's going to be uh, small, right? So, uh, and again, instead of the max, I could use a perceptron or an, or an ML. All of these are just effectively emulating the max operation. And so now, when I do this in two dimensions, it's, a, it's again the same operation. I am scanning left to right, top to bottom. I'm slicing out segments of the image uh, from the, uh, about which are the segments which are about the size of the window I'm considering. I'm putting the segment through an MLP and generating an output. And the final collection of outputs is being put through my softmax to get the overall classification. But then once again, this entire thing is just one giant MLP with the one caveat that all of the low layer, lower layer subnets are identical in structure. And so that makes the network shift or position invariant. And so again, I can view this whole thing as just a giant MLP where the final softmax is the output layer. I could just have called it a giant MLP, right? And so, the first poll. Okay, time's up, folks. Uh, so uh, could, what was, lime turtle? Give me the answer to this one. What was lime turtle? Oh, here, the first yes. one is true. True, okay, thank you. And emerald flamingo, 
Who is Emerald Flamingo? Emerald Flamingo is absent. And uh, who is Bronze Lion? We have Bronze Lion, second one. So does everybody agree that both of these are true? We can determine if a picture has a flower in it by scanning for a flower with an MLP, right? Obviously. And scanning a, flower, a picture for a flower to determine if, if it has a, a flower in it or not is strictly the same as analyzing the entire picture with a single giant MLP, which is basically what we've been saying, right? So the two are equivalent operations. With some caveats, we have shared parameter, uh, shared parameters, meaning subnets in the large network have identical sets of parameters and structure. Now, I'm going to, just for the purpose of illustration, I'm going to change things a bit. So when I was thinking, of, when I was talking about scanning the input, I was drawing MLPs in this manner. Now, if this were a time series, the horizontal axis represents time, right? So as I scan from left to right, that's how I'd be moving. But then this picture is sort of giving you the wrong kind of impression in the sense that if I look at this first layer, the yellow neuron seems to appear after the orange neuron. So it seems to give you the indication that even within the neurons there's some time progression, but that is not the case. Each layer of neurons operates at the same instant, right? And so I'm gonna change the illustration, you know, instead of having something like this, which gives you the wrong impression of time, I'm gonna change the illustration. I'm gonna use a horror vertical illustration. So instead of representing the network like this, I'm going to represent the network like the figure on the left. So each bar represents one layer, and the arrow from one bar to the next bar means that all the neurons in the source layer are connected to all the neurons in the destination layer for each, each arrow, right? Is this illustration making sense to you guys? Right, okay. And so now here, when I draw it vertically like so, instead of drawing something like this, if I drew this, you do get the idea that each bar actually represents a single instant of time and you're scanning through time. So this is for purposes of illustration. I'm gonna be using this picture, okay? So here, uh, I was scanning and I was scanning with a stride of two, meaning I was looking at a size two, then taking a step of size two also. Whereas if I took a step of size one after scan, you know, at each position, this is what the overall operation is going to look like. So everyone with me? Yeah. Now, once again, these are all just really large networks. So because although I'm actually performing a scanning operation and then finally putting everything to a softmax, it's really just one large network it means that I can use conventional backpropagation to train the network. So this means that I could, for example, if I were trying to rec build a welcome recognizer or a flower detector, I could just provide lots and lots of recordings with the word welcome in it, lots of other recordings without the word welcome in it, and just give it this, this class of uh, this network and it will train. But then there's one uh, caveat over here, and the caveat is this that all of the low layer, lower layer uh, you know, subnets, they are identical in structure, right? And parameters. So for example, if over here, after the, if my gradient descent updates the parameters of this subnet, it must update all of these copies in an identical manner because they are all required to be identical. Remember, we're scanning, right? So we will have to change our gradient descent rules a little bit to account for this. These are what, what, what I'm calling shared parameter networks, meaning you have different parameters which, have, which are constrained to have identical values. And you can have shared parameter networks of different kinds, but then here's the general rule. So let's say I have a network of this kind where the two highlighted uh, connections have been set to have identical values. So if that is the case, then these two edges, although they nominally have different symbols, have a common value, Ws. And so if I'm computing any updates for this guy, then the corresponding update must also have happen over here. But this influences the manner in which we compute derivatives for gradient descent. 
So the way you want to think about it is that both of these edges have a shared common value WS. So when I'm updating the network parameters, am I updating the individual edges or am I, am I updating WS? What would I be updating? WS, right? But then if you look at the dependencies, this is what it looks like. WS determines both WIJK and WLMN, right? And each of these in turn influence the divergence. So when I compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to WS, I have to follow the entire graph. And so the derivative of the divergence with respect to WS is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to this guy times the derivative of WIJK with respect to WS, that's this term, plus the derivative of the divergence with respect to this guy times the derivative of WLMN with respect to WS, which is the second term. Now, what is the derivative of WLMN with respect to WS? Anyone? One, right? The two are identical. They're required to be identical. So these second terms are all, these guys are all one, which means the derivative of the divergence with respect to WS is simply the sum of the derivatives of the divergence with respect to the all the terms that are constrained to be identical to WS. That makes sense to everybody? Right? So this means that if I'm trying to perform gradient descent, I would need to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to each of these terms that is constrained to have an identical value and sum up these derivatives to get the overall derivative of the divergence with respect to the common underlying value. And this is how uh, gradient descent is going to be modified. So if I have, if I'm scanning this image for flowers, basically the entire thing is one large subnet, but then at the lowermost layer, I have a bunch of networks which have, uh, which are identical in structure and parameter values. And so you might find different edges which are all required to have the same value. And so if I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to that shared value, I'm going to have to sum the derivative of the divergence with respect to each of these guys. And this is what I would use in my gradient descent updates. And so if I were writing the entire pseudocode, I want to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the common value WS, which is shared by all of these parameters. And that's what I would use to update the common value, right? the shared parameter value. And then once I update the shared parameter value, I can distribute it across, across, across all the terms which share that value. So the question is, how do I actually compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the common value? For that, I'm going to have to go over all of the network parameters that share that common value, and then compute the derivative of the loss with respect to each of these parameters, each of these uh, terms that share this common value and sum them up. And the sum is what I would use for gradient descent. That makes sense to everybody? Yes? What would you say you would have to calculate over each of the parameters that share this common value? That means each of the subnets that scan. And so for example, all of these red arrows are required to have the same value, right? So I'm going to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to this weight, with respect to this weight, and with respect to this weight, and then sum them all up, right? Questions, anybody? Okay. And so on that term, it's going to be computed using backdrop. And so the story so far is that position invariant pattern classification can be performed by scanning one dimensional, in the case of things like uh, time series like sounds, two dimensional scanning for images, but the same principle extends to higher dimensional objects as well. So you could have 3D scans and 4D scans if you're looking at uh, video, for instance, right? or colored images. And scanning is equivalent to composing a large network with repeating subnets. So the large network has shared subnets. And learning in scan networks basically implies that backpropagation rules must be modified to combine gradients from parameters that share the same value. This principle applies not just to scanning networks, but to any network there where 
we use the idea of shared parameter values. Questions? Any questions on Zoom? Okay. All right. So now let's take a look, closer look at uh, how this thing works. So I'm going to try. To, I'm going to uh, scan this input using the network shown. This is a three-layer network, and it has four neurons in the first layer, two in the second, one in the third. I'm going to draw the network vertically as I just explained. Now, when this network scans the input at each position, the first layer computes a bunch of values shown by the four gray circles. And the first layer computes its values from the input itself. The second layer computes a bunch of values shown by the green circles, and it computes its values from the first layer outputs. And the third layer computes its values from the outputs of the second layer. Is this illustration making sense to everybody? So at each position, all of those seven terms are going to be computed. The four first layer terms, the two second layer terms, and the one third layer term. And so when you scan, we would be computing this value at each position that we scan. And then the set of final layer values are going to be passed to the softmax. This is the complete set of operations, right? But now, let's just say that after computing the the, its values in the first window, the first layer doesn't wait for the subsequent layers of the network to perform their operations and goes off and does its business in a hurry, like so. And then after the second layer, first layer has done its operation, scanning the input, the rest of the network picks up the values that the first layer computed in the first position and computes its output. Will the output and the final output in the first position be different? Yes or no? Can I hear a no, combined no from everybody? No. A little more enthusiastically, guys. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea, right? So changing the order of operation didn't really change anything over here. And so the output here does not change due to the reordered computation, right? Now, similarly, now, since the first layer has computed all of its terms, all of its values, the second layer now can compute its outputs in the first position, but without waiting for the third layer, it can go off and perform its computations <clears throat> over all time, right? And then the third layer operates on the second layer outputs. Would the output be different now? Okay, combined? No. Thank you, right, just wake up, right. And so the output here does not change due to the reordered computation. And so you can actually have the entire computation done. Now what have we done here? We have not changed anything as far as the final outcome is concerned. All we did was change the order of computation, right? And so if I take a look at the pseudocode, here's what we were doing earlier. We were going over time. At each position in time, we were pulling out a slice of the input, passing it through an MLP. We were collecting the MLP outputs at each position and then passing the collection through my softmax, right? And so let me expand this, this block a bit, right? Just this little portion. I've got my segment. What is this MLP doing? Now the MLP has many layers. And so we're actually at each position, we're, position we're going through the layers. The first layer and the first layer alone looks at a chunk of the input, right? So over here, the first layer was looking at this block. And so the first layer and the first layer alone looks at a chunk of the input. Subsequent layers simply look at the output of the previous layer, right? And so if I think, write the pseudocode in this manner, I'm saying the first layer is operating on a chunk of inputs. And then after that, each layer is, the each lth layer is just reading in some values from the L minus one layer at the same time, computing an affine value and putting it through an activation. And then finally, when I have the outputs at each position, I'm putting them through the softmax. Now, all of the main computation is being done in the highlighted blue, blue region, right? So if I flipped, so there are two indices. The first is over time. The second is over layers, if I'm doing the regular scanning, right? But if I flip these two loops, would the final output change? No, because all of the computation is being done inside the innermost block, right? Right? 
And so when I scan, that's basically all I did. I moved the layers out top and moved the time index inside. And that's basically the entire operation. This doesn't change the final output, right? So the same thing for two-dimensional inputs. If I had two-dimensional inputs like this picture, then I could create an MLP, which would analyze each window of the input and generate its output. <coughs> and now this, I'm, going, I'm just, the input is the, the input layer, what we call the input layer is the block of inputs that we're looking at, right? the window of inputs we're looking at. And so this word could scan the input by just running over the entire image. And at each position, it's actually going to generate an output. And all of these outputs are finally put through a, a, a softmax to get your final output. But then I can change the order of computation. Instead of having the entire network analyze the entire input at each time, I can say that the first layer, the neurons of the first layer, they are in a hurry. And they're just going to scan the input like so. And so the neuron, this first neuron might just scan the entire input and it's going to get one output at each position, right? I could arrange this output in the same pattern as the input itself so that the output of the neuron is basically a map of the input. And this can be done by all of the neurons in the first layer. So now, if I want to find out if there's a flower in this region shown by the box, I just need to look at the outputs computed by the first layer neurons when they were analyzing that box. And those would be the highlighted red, red dots. And the rest of the network can just operate on these set of red dots, one from each neuron, right? And the output, the final output is going to be the same as what you would have got if you had just focused on that one window using the entire network. Everyone with me? Yeah, okay. So we're taking... Yes. If all of the neurons are operating like doing the same thing, then why, like, when we get computation from that position, like, how would we get the output from... The four neurons have different sets of weights. But mm -hmm. if they were sitting in the same data, then those would be the same. Would they be? If, if, I, have, if I have an MLP, the MLP is being trained on a collection of data, but the, for all of the first layer neurons are seeing the same data, are they not? Yeah. And so, but like, I guess, what's the difference between each of them? So uh, this is okay. Uh, uh, let's answer this question. Suppose I just tra gave you a collection of data, right? Forget about the fact that I'm scanning. And so I just gave you a collection of data. And I trained an MLP with this. Would all of these neurons be the same? I just gave you a collection of data and trained an MLP. Would all the first layer neurons be the same? In your experience, in your homework, were all the neurons the same? Yeah, each neuron is being differently initialized, right? They're all, they're not, it's not symmetric. They're all learning to detect different pa patterns, right? Yes or no? So if they were initialized in different ways? Yeah, so that's what we always do. You've done your homework one. What was different? You were training on MNIST digits, correct? Were all the first layer neurons identical? They would be different. There's really no difference between this. The fact that we are scanning hasn't changed anything. It's like taking, saying that I'm taking each window and treating that as an, another input, another instance in my training mini batches. That's it, right? I mean, you can literally think of it this way. When I'm scanning, I could, I could just look at my picture, and then I can slice this out and make this one example. I can slice this out and make, make this another example. And so I'm going to get an entire collection of examples from my input image. And I'm training, I'm training 
my entire network using that collection of inputs. Practically, that is really what is happening, right? So you have for neurons, for neurons that you have for different Yeah, each of them is scanning. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an MLP, right? The fact that it's scanning is kind of immaterial. If you think of, you could perform the same operation by slicing out each of the segments and training the, using them as a collection of inputs, correct? That's basically what we're doing. The only thing that changed was during inference, you're ordering the collection. But during training, training doesn't change, right? So, yeah. So if you initialize all of them to zero, it's like the same thing. Then they're symmetric. Then they're not gonna get off that position, right? right? There's no difference. If there's no difference in the beginning, there will be no difference in the end. Right. Yeah. Why would this be computationally any different? It's exactly the same operation. So why is it different? Reorder the scan. You're asking me why, we, okay, don't ask me why we reordered the scan just yet, but uh, scanning layer-wise is actually more efficient in some ways, but there's, there, are, there are other reasons for it. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. I'm just think people might be confused between the weights of each neuron versus the weights of the sub-network that we're using. So the neurons will each have different weights, but we're using the same group of neurons for each scan. Yeah. So the subnet, so, so here is what, here's a different way of thinking about it, right? When you're scanning, what did I do? So when I'm training, so when I'm performing inference, what I'm really doing is this, for my, in my speech case, I have a recording, I take the slice out and I form a little window, right? Then I take this next slice out and I form a little instance. And so I'm eventually going to get an entire bunch of instances. And then I'm perform and analyzing each one of these with my MLP. And if any one of them fires, I'm calling it a success. Right, but this is no different from a regular MLP. Anyway. Yes. They are not redundant. You're just because the so the final classification you're asking is: Is there a welcome in the set? Right. And so in that sense, you're going, to, you're going to be averaging over, you're going to be taking a max over the set. So, for, so, the, so you have not done any additional computation, nor do you have any additional parameters. So there is no redundancy. So, so here's the thing. We are not actually doing the uh, we're creating a network with 1,000 copies of it. That's why we're changing it to a scan. Right, when you scan, you're not replicating the network, you're performing exactly the same computation as before. So the point of the scanning approach is that you're not actually creating this gigantic network with identical subnets. You could, but we don't. We don't need to, right? That's the benefit from scanning. If that answered your questions, right? All right, so let me continue, right? Now I can recurse the logic. If the first layer neurons have all scanned the input and arranged their inputs, outputs in a pattern, now the second layer neurons can do the same thing, right? Except observe that the second layer neurons are actually looking at one position from the maps produced by each of the first layer neurons. They're simultaneously looking at all of the first layer neurons. And then, if I want to find out if there is a flower over here, I just have to look at the outputs produced by the second layer neurons when they were analyzing that position, which in turn is being obtained by reading the outputs of the first layer position neurons in these positions, and so we're guaranteed that, this, that the entire network is now analyzing the, the window shown, right? 
And so we can now, we can do the same thing with the final layer neuron. The final layer neuron can now scan the maps produced by the second layer neurons and for forget, obtain a classification output for, output for every position in the input. And the entire collection can now be passed through, passed through a, a max or a soft max, right? And so if I want to find out if uh, there's a flower in any specific location in the input, I just need to read the output of the final layer neurons when it was scanning that position. And if, the, in the, if in the act of scanning, we arrange the outputs in the same pattern as the input itself, then the, uh, then the outputs of the individual neurons are effectively just maps of the input. And so you could just go to the corresponding location to detect if there was a flower there or not. Make sense? Right, okay. And of course, I can put the entire collection through a softmax to decide if there was a flower in the entire picture. So typically, the output of the final layer is you know, flattened out. It's set, set as a single extended vector before you pass it through the network. But anyway, that's besides the point. So what did we do in the process of scanning over here? We, uh, same as in the one-dimensional case, and now in the standard two-dimensional case, you were going through X and Y, pulling out a slice, passing it through an MLP, and putting the collection through the softmax, collection of outputs through the softmax. But then this bit, the innermost bit, this MLP, consisted of many layers. The first layer looked at a window of the input. Subsequent layers just looked at a single position from the outputs of all the neurons in the previous layer. And you just, and so at each position, the entire input was passed through all of the layers to get the output at that position. And once again, all of the action is in the highlighted region, which is in the innermost loop, which means that if I flip the orders of the outer loops, the final of computation is not going to change. Which means that I can go, I can scan the outputs of the previous layers with, with each layer first, right? And so I can perform my scanning with the layers and, uh, and then go through the layers. So basically, what, when I just reordered these scans and I said the first layer neurons can go off and do their own thing, that's basically what I did. I just changed the order of the outputs. Does that make sense to everybody? Right. So that's easy, right? Anyway, here's a, so the story so far, Position invariant pattern classification can be performed by scanning the input for target patterns. And scanning is equivalent to composing a uh, large network with shared subnets. And the operations in scanning the input with a full network can be equivalently reordered as scanning the input with individual neurons in the first layer to produce scan maps of the input. And then you're jointly scanning the maps produced by the previous layer neurons. The joint scanning is kind of important in that when you look at what the second layer neuron is doing, uh, the second layer neurons are actually simultaneously scanning all of the, uh, the scanning all of the maps produced by the first layer neurons, right? So now we have our second part. Teal hummingbird. It's true. Okay, thank you. And uh, pink woodpecker, what about the second question? Pink woodpecker is absent. Okay. Silver eagle. Who is silver eagle? There is no silver eagle. Not present. And pink lion. Who is pink lion? All right here, it's true. It's true, okay, thank you. And so scanning an input image with an MLP is mathematically equivalent to first scanning it with the individual neurons in the first hidden layer, then scanning the outputs of the maps of the uh, first layer neurons with the rest 
rest of the network, right? This is true. And the operation we said can be recursed. Scanning the output maps of the first layer with the rest of the network is equivalent to scanning the first layer maps of the second layer and then scanning the second layer maps of the remaining network, which is basically what we also saw. So uh, they are, it's all the same. Uh, changing the order doesn't change the final operation. And so uh, the entire MLP for a flower-like pattern basically looks like a, uh, for, uh, the entire MLP basically looks for flower-like patterns at each position, yes, Karthik? Uh, the, if we don't uh, uh, train the first layer and then train the second layer, then the second layer can't join. We are, we are not training the first layer and then the second layer. We are training the entire network all at once. So what we are really doing is this, right? The entire giant network with the shared subnets is being given the training data, and uh, we are learning all of them at once, right? Okay. So now let's see how each of the layers behaves, right? The first layer neurons look at the entire window to extract window level features. So if you're doing a flower detector, the first layer neurons are all going to look for flower-like features. And the subsequent layers only perform classification over these window level, win window sized features. So the task of detecting flower-like patterns has been entirely assigned to the first level neuron, first layer neurons who now have to compute all of the features. Subsequent neurons and layers only operate on these features to perform classification. Now we could instead distribute this. And what do I mean by distributing this? The first layer neurons can now look at, instead of looking at an, the entire input, the flower sized input, uh, or, or a window which is the size of the flower, right? The first layer neurons could be looking at smaller windows of this kind and scanning the input with the, uh, with the smaller window. But then the real classification we want performed is on the larger window, right? So if I want the larger window, now the second layer neurons, because the first layer neurons outputs have been arranged in the shape of the, as a map of the input. So the second layer neurons can now directly look at windows of outputs from the first layer neurons. And now when the second layer neuron looks at this window of outputs, basically it's looking at all regions of the input that, were, that are represented by the values in this window, which would be the entire input window, right? And so by doing this, and by so doing, what we have done is distributed the window over two layers. The first layer is not looking over the entire window. The first layer is looking at smaller regions of the input. And the second layer is looking at a window of outputs from the first layer and effectively looking at the entire window in the input. So it's now a distributed input. Uh, it's now, the pattern has now been distributed over two layers, right? And so now the second layer can, uh, now wh what happens over here is that when I do this, Instead of looking for flower sized patterns in the first layer, I can look for smaller things like say petals and sepals and such like. I know that petals look somewhat identical. Sepals look somewhat, somewhat identical. And the second layer neuron is going to, going to learn that if it finds maybe, maybe the four, four neurons find four different kinds of features. The first neuron finds petals, the second one finds sepals, the third looks up something, something like a stamen. And so uh, it might find that if it finds something, the second layer neuron is now going to find that if there's something like a petal in the top two positions and something like maybe a stamen in the top right and something else in the middle and, and the kind of feature that the fourth neuron detects at the bottom right, this combination represents something that is inherent of flowers. And so it's actually going to learn this structure. And each of the second layer neurons is going to learn such structures. So... The second layer neurons are now going to scan the outputs of the first layer neurons, but they're going to do so by considering a window of outputs of the first layer neurons. And they're going to be simultaneously scanning the maps produced by all the neurons in the first layer, right? Because all of them must be considered simultaneously because the second layer neurons are considering the outputs of all of the first layer neurons. 
And so it's jointly scanning all the first layer neurons, uh, first layer maps, and each output of the second layer neurons represents the output for one full-sized window. And so it would do something like this, right? And then the second, and now if I want to compute, determine if there's a flower in the top left corner, nothing has changed. The third layer simply has to look at the top left uh, element in the maps produced by the second layer neurons. And by when it considers all of them jointly, it's basically going to be performing a classification of the top left window of the uh, input. And that's so the, so the uh, final output neuron could just be scanning the maps produced by the second layer neurons, which is going to get classification outputs for all the positions, and those can be passed through a softmax. So did this business of distributing make sense to you guys? Yes, no, raise your hands if it did. I'll wait till everybody raises your hands. I have a question. Okay, yeah. So, so if you are scanning the first layer small blocks with weight three times three scanners, I think the, um, the, the, map, the, the map output for the second layer will not be nine times nine layers. So here is what would be happening, right? If, why do my chalks keep disappearing? Yeah, because they all end up on this table. So the first layer neuron, say it looks at these three positions to compute these nine values, right? And I have one for each of the first layer neurons. If the second layer neurons looks at this window, it's going to be looking at these nine values, right? The values computed from these nine positions, which is going to be this window. It's not nine cross nine, it's a single output for the entire window. So I mean, I mean the, the output for the first layer of neurons is like nine times nine outputs. It's going to be three cross three for that particular, within that window, right? Yeah. yeah. And he's asking why the size of the maps are same are the same after the first layer and after the second layer because the size of the map should be reducing. Exactly. I'm still scanning while moving one position at a time, right? So the uh, all we are saying is that the maps are going to be proportional to the input. So that depends on the stride. We'll get back to that. So if I have an input here, then the first near neuron looks at this position here, and then moves by one pixel and then looks at this position, right? You're going to get an output which is approximately the same size as this input. If it moves by the entire window size, it's going to be shrunk. So don't go by the pictures. It's just that they're proposed, think of them as being proportional to the uh, input, sure, sure. right? Yeah, thank you. All right, so regardless of all of this, this is still just scanning with a shared parameter network. And how is that? Uh, this is in that, if I look at this guy, suppose I was having the equivalent of this network to the right. Then this black neuron over here would have produced nine outputs from this window. The red neuron would also have produced nine outputs from the window. So would the green neuron. So from that window, I'm gonna have 27 outputs. And all of these 27 outputs are going to be considered by the uh, second layer neuron. But then when you look at this, second layer neurons, these nine, so this is like having 27 neurons in the first layer of my network, and then two layers, neurons in the second layer, second layer of the network. But those 27 neurons have only three sets of parameters, because all the red neurons have identical parameters, all the blue ones have identical parameters, and all the black ones have identical parameters. So this entire thing is still what happened is that we took this business of a shared parameter network and, and moved it even further down so that within the network itself you have additional subnets which have shared parameters, right? And so the network that analyzes the individual blocks is now itself a shared parameter network. Does that make sense? Right. Question. Yeah. Do we need to do any operation for the output of, uh, of the first layer before we put it into the second layer? We have, not, we, we have not made any such assumptions. All we are saying is that 
each of the inputs is each of the neurons is just scanning a smaller size of the input. That's right. So we have not changed anything about the basic principles of MLPs themselves. They're all the same. And now, so I can do the same thing by distributing the pattern over three layers. The first layer neurons can be looking at really small windows to compute their maps. The second layer neurons could be looking at a small window of the maps produced by the first layer, in which case the second layer neurons are going to be looking at a slightly larger window overall of the first layer, right? And then the third layer of neurons can now be looking at a small window of outputs of the second layer. And they will effectively be looking at a larger window still of the, of the in, overall input. And so what we have done here is that we have distributed that window, but now we have done this over three layers. And so uh, this, and what this means is that effectively now the final, uh, the our outputs of the final layer neurons are considering the entire window that we wanted to analyze, although the, the neurons in the previous layers were looking at smaller and smaller windows. And so the final classification basically uh, views the outputs, which views the outputs from all of the locations, is actually going to be detecting the, uh, the presence of a flower in the entire image. So what you can see over here is that in the process of distributing things, I've basically taken the notion of a shared parameter network, which was earlier being applied only to the final uh, classifier. Everything below the softmax was one big network which kept repeating. I've taken that concept down one to every single layer of the network. Nonetheless, the whole thing can still be viewed as just scanning the entire network input with an MLP with the one distinction that within the MLP itself, you have shared parameters at every layer. So again, the idea I want to bring across to you is that in all of this, we have not deviated from the original concept, which is that we are scanning the input with an MLP and then taking a classification on, performing a classification on the outputs obtained at each position. The only thing that changed was that we distributed the size of the input over the over, over the layers of the network, but this is still just scanning. And so how does that change in terms of pseudocode? Remember, earlier when I was scanning the two-dimensional two input, I had something of this kind. I was scanning over, the basic scan did something like this. I was scanning over X and Y. Then when I, at each position I was going through the layers, the first layer and first layer alone was looking at a segment of the input a square segment of the input, and subsequent layers, we're simply looking at a single position from the maps produced by the, by the previous layers. That's, that was the basic scan that I had when I did not distribute the pattern over many layers. So my code ended up having the special case for the first layer. When, on the other hand, so, and that's where we sort of swap the layers and the scanning, right? Now, on the other hand, if I say that every neuron is actually going to be looking at a window from the, from the previous layer. The pseudocode actually just became simpler, in fact, in that at each layer, I'm pulling out a segment which is a little window from all of the, from the maps produced by all of the neurons in the previous layer, and then computing my affine values on this window, and then finally putting it through an activation. So it actually kind of simplifies the code. And this business of scanning the output, uh, the combined outputs of the previous layer with a little window of, uh, over, a, with a, over a little window, right, with a little window. This business is called convolution. And so this entire network is actually called a convolutional neural network. The convolu again, a convolutional neural network is basically just a standard MLP scanning the input where we begin, uh, you know, where uh, we begin distributing, we begin sharing parameters at various levels, right? So this entire network is a CNN or a convolutional neural network. And I can do the whole thing with uh, vector notation and the code becomes simpler still. But any questions? So, questions? Yeah. In, in practice, would you, like, if you're trying to, or could you achieve a scan by making, like, a dense layer comprised of multiple copies of the convolutional you could. It's just going to be inefficient to actually, you know, why would you want to build such a small, large thing when you can just use a smaller 
network can explicitly scan. Compute the loose memory that you save on time. No, the amount of computation is still going to be exactly the same, right? There's no change in the amount of computation. So now, just to give you an idea of how this happens, I'm going to consider a, consider a one-dimensional scan. So here's, here's an input that I'm trying to scan for the word welcome. Then the first layer neurons, uh, so say that big block represents the width of the word welcome that I expect to see. Then the first layer neurons are actually going to be looking at a small section of the input and producing outputs at each position. The second layer neurons are now, are now going to try to look at a wider region of the input. But to do so, they're actually going to be looking at a small window of outputs from the first layer neurons. And then the, and they would scan. So the second layer neurons are now not scanning the input. They're scanning the output produced by the first layer neurons. And the third layer neurons are now going to look at the entire wind, window of input over which we expect to find the word welcome. But to do that, they will be looking at a window of outputs produced by the second layer neurons. And so if you actually track the, the width that is, that, that is effectively uh, analyzed in the input, that's going to be the entire duration of the word that you expect to see for the word welcome. Right? And, so the, second, and the, uh, so the third layer neurons will be scanning windows from the outputs of the second layer neurons. So is this illustration clarifying what we just discussed? OK. And then, of course, the final set of outputs is going to be passed through the softmax. In the 2D case, it's just a 2D generalization of this basic idea. OK? So for the 1D case, this is called a time-delay neural network. For the two-dimensional case, it's a convolutional neural network. But a TDNN is also often called a one-dimensional convolutional neural network. Here's a poll. Yeah. I, yeah, I need to get another clicker. All right. Olive Flamingo, is that first statement true? Who's Olive Flamingo? Olive Flamingo is absent. Uh, Silver Lama, is the first second statement true? Who's Silver Lama? Yes, is the first statement, is it true? It's not true, thank you. And Pink Eagle, who's Pink Eagle? Pink Eagle is absent. Who's Gold Wolf? Come on, if somebody wants to be a gold wolf, gold wolf is absent. Okay, who's indigo shark? Indigo shark, absent. Pink bear, who is pink bear? Absent also, okay. And who's pink lion? Came back to pink All lion. right here. Yeah. Okay, second statement, is it true? Yes. Okay, thank you. And T Lama. There's no T Lama. Okay. And there's a gray Lama. Who's the gray Lama? Okay, I've given up on the class. Uh, guys, uh, can tell me that someone tell me if the third statement is true. Yeah. And the fourth? False. False. Thank you. Right. I, we will be posting these attendance. And I did warn you that you will be scored for attendance. I do maintain the uh, right to change the uh, you know, fraction of the overall score that is assigned to attendance in class. And if I find that the attendance, attendance is sufficiently low, it might be worth 25 points percent of your marks. Right, okay. So only the second and third statements are true. So non-distributed scanning does not require the output maps to be arranged in the same shape as the input, right? Because you're not looking, on, you're not looking at windows. Even if I permuted things, it wouldn't really matter. But when I scan in a distributed manner, the arrangement is really important because the output must map the input. Otherwise, the notion of a window no longer makes sense. Now, why distribute? Why bother with all of this? To see why, let's actually look at a very simple example. 
It's got firstly, distribution forces hierarchical representations with localized patterns in lower layers. So this is more generalizable. It also results in fewer computations and fewer parameters. So let's look at this guy. Remember, way back when, when we were speaking of trying to build these classifiers for this double pentagon decision boundaries, if you had simply tried to do this without considering the problem itself, it wouldn't have worked very well. What we did was to build up this boundary one piece at a time. We first captured the lines, the boundaries, right? Then second, we captured the pentagons. Then we combined them into the larger pentagon. And doing this was what made it really efficient. And so having this kind of distribution is really key for parameter efficiency and for generalization. And so this distributed representation of the patterns makes things a lot more generalizable. You can distribute, uh, you can sort of let each layer focus on smaller and smaller things and, and, so, and have to specialize, uh, give it a better ability to specialize. Now, the other thing which makes this distribution really useful is the fact that we're going to use fewer computations and fewer parameters to understand how Let's go back and look at the simple network. Now, is this network a distributed scan? Yes or no? No, why not? It's only scanning that one segment, right? So this, just, this network, if it, if it were scanning the input, it's going to be performing this particular computation. I'm just not going to show the dots within the individual bars to save myself, you know, to make things easier to visualize, but then within each of these bars, I have a certain number of neurons. I have N1 neurons in the first layer, N2 in the second, N3 in the third, and the network itself is looking at a width of L inputs. Here, the, the, in my picture, there are eight. So again, if this were a spectrogram, each of these black bars is going to represent a vector of some dimension D. So how many parameters would I need over here? I have N1 neurons here. Each of them is looking at eight inputs. Each input has D dimensions. So the first layer is going to require eight D N1 parameters. The second layer has N2 neurons, each looking at N1 inputs. So how many parameters would I need? N1 times N2. And what about the third layer? N2, N3, right? So that's it. So uh, now, and so, now let me try to distribute this over the same thing, over two layers. When I distribute it, uh, I'm going to have four, the, the first layer is only going to be looking at a width of two in the input. And the second layer is going to be looking at a width of four from the first layer outputs, right? So now if I have, what is the effective width I'm looking at over here now? It's still eight, it hasn't changed, right? But then that's, so how many parameters would I need? If I have N1 neurons over here, then N1 neurons, each of them is looking at a width of two of dimension D. So the first layer neurons are looking at two D N1 uh, parameters, right? Because these four guys are identical. What about the second layer? How many, how many parameters does it need? Four and one times N2, right? It's looking at, uh, at a width of four. And the third one, of course, just requires N2 times N3. So you can see the number of parameters, right? Those are all the unique parameters that you want, that, that the model has. And now compare this with a, no, with a non-distributed network. If the non-distributed network has the same number of neurons, because you're looking at detecting features, right? So to have the same number of neurons, this would require four N1 neurons for the two models to be equivalent in terms of, terms of neurons. And so if you look at the number of parameters they need, this guy needed 2D N1 plus four N1, N2 plus N2, N3. That one required 32D N1 plus four N1, N2 plus N2, N3. So just by having the, distributing the pattern over two layers, I got a factor of eight gain in the number of parameters in the first layer. That makes sense to everybody? Right. So that's huge. And now let's look at the other thing. So we can see why distributing reduces the number of parameters. 
how does it reduce computation? So if I'm scanning with this guy, those are the computations that I'm going to be performing in the first layer, right? Now let's just say that I'm striding by two, so I'm skipping by two at each position. Now there are four yellow bars that I have to compute in the first layer, even in the second position. Do I have to recompute all four of them, or can I reuse some of these computations? I can reuse the first three, right? And so you can see how this basically means that at each time, instead of computing four N1 bars, I'm just going to be computing N1. So the amount of compute has gone down by a factor of four also. So every reduction in the number of parameters comes with a re corresponding reduction in the amount of compute. So there's a double gain, right? Because you're reusing term, reusing uh, compute. It's basically, so at each position, you're basically reusing the outputs of the three of the first layer blocks. This is when the computation is distributed over only two layers. If I distribute this over three layers, how many parameters would this network require? Anyone? How many would this require? OK, someone help me here. Can I call a name? So there's Gray Lama again. So Gray Lama, how many, how many parameters would this network require? Gray Lama is absent. OK, maybe blessed, you can tell me. K and one times D. I'm here, K is, I'm, my K is two over here. So the first layer is two, two D and one. What about the second one? Yeah, what is it gonna be? Yeah. It's gonna be two and one and, uh, and two. And for the third? Two and two and three, right? And so that's two D and one plus two and one and two plus two and two and three, right? If I had a corresponding network without distributed parameters with the same number of neurons, then it's going to have four and one neurons in the first layer, two and two in the second layer, and, and three in the third layer. And if you again look at the numbers, that's going to be 32 D and one for the first layer. It's going to be eight and one and two for the second layer and two and two and three for the third layer. So again, not only did we gain a, gain a factor of eight in the first layer, we gained a factor of four and the second as well. So every time we distribute parameters, we are going to end up, distribute the pattern over more layers. We're going to require fewer and fewer parameters, right? Now in terms of compute, again, let's say I'm striding by two. So the colored blocks show the computations that you'd require in the first position when you're scanning. But can you see any terms that are being re reused when I'm scanning the second position? Right? So if I'm, if I'm scanning in the second position, I'm, I'm reusing these two guys, right? And this. So I'd be re reusing the three yellow bars if I'm starting by two. If I'm starting by one, so all of these guys are being reused, right? Uh, and so if I'm starting by one, right, if I have something of this kind, then you can see that I'm also reusing things in the second layer. So uh, basically, by having this distributed scan, where I'm distributing the pattern over many layers, you end up reusing a lot of compute from the previous layers. And so that is the second saving. Right, questions? No. Okay. All right, so we, so, you know, the same thing holds for two D, the, 2D, the 2D case as well. We reuse computation, so for example, uh, for the two adjacent windows shown in, shown in black and yellow, all of the blocks in the overlapping region don't, do not have to be recomputed. You can just reuse the computation from those which means that you're getting the benefit of analyzing a large window for the added compute of just computing values for one column of uh, inputs, right? One column of boxes. I have some numbers on the slides, which I will skip, but then you can actually look at the, uh, look at the slides and you, will see, you can see that the order, the uh, saving in parameters can be several orders of magnitude so also the saving in compute, right? And so why distribute? Distribution forces localized patterns in lowest lower layers, so it's more generalizable. 
it reduces the number of parameters, so often by orders of magnitude, and you get orders of magnitude gains from shared computation, reused computation. So the key intuition is that regardless of the distribution, we can still view the network as effectively scanning the input with an MLP. And the only difference is the manner in which the parameters are being shared, right? All right. So now, can you actually shut the laptop fully? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the story so far, just adding to the what we've seen earlier, the operations and scanning the network with a input with a full network can be reordered as scanning the input with individual neurons in the first layer, and then scanning, jointly scanning the outputs of subsequent of each layer by subsequent layer neurons. And the scanning block can be distributed over multiple layers of the network, which results in significant reduction in both the total number of parameters and the total compute by reusing compute, right? Okay, Coral Tiger is the first statement true? Yes. Thank you. And Scarlet Rabbit, who's Scarlet Rabbit? So the second statement, true, thank you. And Emerald Eagle, who's Emerald Eagle? The third statement, is that true or not? Emerald Eagle, absent. And Bronze Falcon, true or false? Yes. Yeah, it's true. true. Third statement. Okay, and Indigo Owl. Who's Indigo Owl? Indigo Owl is absent here. Yeah. Uh, who's Apricot Rabbit? This is Apricot Rabbit is absent. Indigo Woodpecker. Who's Indigo Woodpecker? <laughs> there are uh, yes. Yeah. True so or false? For the last... Yeah, last false? one is false. False? Yeah. So the distributed scanning enables hierarchical composition of patterns, which results in more generalizable models. Very good. Uh, it results in greatly reduced parameters. It, it provides computational advantage through the reuse of computation. And the person who gave me the last answer, that was a very good catch. It does not result in reduced memory. You're computing exactly the same number of intermediate values as before. Right? Nice job. So, any questions? No, okay, just, I'm gonna go a couple of minutes over. Some final touches, so firstly, uh, when I look at uh, the uh, scanning, right, the entire operation can be redrawn as maps of the entire image. Each neuron scans and redraws the input with some features enhanced. So you can think of it as, you know, each of these is a filter which is scanning the input and it highlights when something shows up, right? So you can think of this neuron as creating a map of the input, except that any time maybe a petal shows up, the colors are enhanced. So you can literally think of it as enhancing the input through feature detection. So the first, uh, the first layer neurons, each of them is going to be enhancing different portions, or different aspects, different features of the input. And the second layer neurons are going to be doing the same, except they're going to be looking at larger regions of the input than the first layer neurons. And, and so the second layer neuron is going to be, when, when it's scanning the output of the first layer neurons, it's scanning the input. It's creating a map of the input, basically redrawing the input with something suppressed and something's highlighted. And the third layer neurons are also going to be doing the same, right? So the first layer neurons is going to be looking at sub-regions of the main image, maybe like petals. The second, region, second layer neurons are going to be looking at regions and the outputs of the first layer. So put the petals together to play, create paths of flowers. And uh, the third layer is going to be looking at larger patterns. 
we can have any number of layers, but it's always useful to think of each layer as repainting the input with features highlighted, right? And now, so these, each of the scanning neurons is generally called a filter, especially the set of weights. They're, they're often called a filter. They're also termed, sometimes called kernels. Each filter scans for a pattern in the map that it operates on. And the, now each of them is looking for a different kind of pattern. Maybe the first layer neurons are looking for petals. The second layer neurons are looking for parts of flowers, right? The patterns that they are looking for are what we will call receptive fields, but these receptive fields are within a region. And so the size of the overall window that they are looking at is called the size of the receptive field. The actual patterns are not, except for the first layer neurons, the first layer filters, the actual patterns that are being uh, detected are not immediately apparent because as we know that as you go higher into the network, there can be or operations and and operations. And so the kinds of patterns that they look for, uh, each neuron could be looking for diff multiple patterns through oring. So it's never evident what the higher layer, higher layer neurons are actually looking for. Although for any given input, you might be able to find this out, right? And the re so the rectangular maps of the neurons in the final layer, they give you basically a repainting of the entire input, but when we pass it through a classifier, we generally redraw it as a vector through an operation called flattening. Uh, some minor modifications, when you're scanning, you can be scanning with a stride of any size. You could be scanning with a size of one pixel, in which case the output maps are gonna be more or less the same size as the input or you could be using larger strides, which will result in a shrinking of the input, right? Uh, then another common uh, modification that we have is to account for jitter. So you might say that a flower is detected if I have petals arranged in this particular manner, but you know, if the position of a petal is slightly off, does that stop it from being a flower? Not really, right? So we sort of, just as we sort of re, did this notion of scanned scanning within each of the subnets. Now we began by saying I'm going to scan the entire input for a pattern. When I distribute the net pattern, I'm saying that even within each subnet I'm performing scans, right? So we sort of shared the idea, or re reused the idea of scanning through the depth of the network, right? We can do the same thing about with what we did in the final layer. In the final layer, we asked the question, does this have a flower? The way we did it was saying, I'm gonna look at all of the inputs and do a max. So that makes it position, inva position invariant. Similarly, I can draw the same concept into the individual layers of the network and say, I'm, I'm trying to detect petals, but I'm not too bothered about the precise position of the petals. And so that gives us something called a pooling layer where you'd be looking at little regions of the input and picking the largest value. So pooling layers are basically introducing jitter invariance at the sub-pattern level, where you scan the input for jitter invariance, right? And the entire structure, which includes basically this business of scanning and combining evidence through some kind of pooling, uh, it's called a convolutional neural network. At the end of the day, I want you to remember that nothing really changed. We are still dealing with MLPs. The entire network is still one giant MLP with shared parameters. The entire network is also just a case of scanning the input and looking for patterns. But in the, at the end of the day, it's still just a multi-layer perceptron. We'll pick up in the next class. Any questions?